Canvas History Society, Mark Reed, the editor of Canvas History Magazine. J'aimerais inviter Mark Reed de Histoire Canada pour continuer la discussion avec moi. History.ca, their model after Pierre Burton's bow ties. Uh, it only took me six YouTube videos to learn how to tie it, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, c'est mon grand plaisir de parler avec Marc Zulke ce soir. Marc is uh, an amazing writer and an amazing storyteller, and I have to laugh because uh, I've read and glanced through some of your books, Marc, but I thought I better uh, do a little bit of homework, so I printed off just the praises of your books. And it was page after page after page, 11 pages in total um, for 11 books, and that's just a Canadian battle series. Um, yet, there's always the first moment. There's always the first time that a writer sits down. And one of the things um, that I think a lot of writers share is that the first moment when you sit down, you start to think, oh my gosh, what have I gotten into here? What am I doing? Do I have a story in me to tell? Can you take us back to the very first uh, book that you wrote and, and, and walk us through what you were thinking when you were sitting down to write? I'll go back to uh, the first history book I wrote, which was a, actually not a war, but a military history book. It was called Scottish Dreamers and Second Sons, British Women's Men in the Canadian West. And it was one of these, it's how you come to an idea of a book. I, um, I grew up in the Okanagan Valley and lived most of uh, my early years in, in the valley and worked in the valley for a long time. And, and there was this story that you always heard about when it was an area that many of the remittance men had come to and settled. And remittance men from Britain were people who were from a higher, um, higher class of society whose parents had basically given them checks to get out of town. Because uh, <laughs> they, they were scoundrels <laughs> and they were second sons. And so there was a story that when World War I occurred, um, was announced, that they burned their cabins. One guy would ride to the other person's cabin and the other would ride to the others. And they burned all the cabins and they rode off to war and they never came back because most of them died. And I was like, this is just such a and so I started doing, doing some digging around and um, realized that they have made this incredible impact across Canada, particularly Western Canada, um, from Manitoba right to Vancouver Island. And so yes, I, I decided I would write this book. But I'd never written a book of history before. I had a history BA, but that was it. Um, and so yeah, you end up staring at those days of the computer screen had little green letters because that's all that. <laughs> when was this? What year? This is 1990, no, 1989. No, no, pardon me, 1993. Yeah. And so, before the internet, you couldn't just type up, you couldn't Google remittance money. No, 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 no. Uh, the internet effectively didn't exist except yeah. unless you're in the US military. Uh, you know, so, um, and there was no email. So I was doing a lot of going, traveling around, um, going to little archives in places like Duncan you know, on Vancouver Island and, and rooting through letters and stuff and I'd find a remittance there. And it, so it was very difficult, um, that kind of writing. But also just the writing process was very difficult because it was taking a, a really very scattered kind of story and saying, well, how am I going to do this? And I use a writing technique that's called free fall. And basically what it is is you do a whole bunch of research first, so you got to get a sense of things. Mm -hmm. And then you just sit down and you just start to write. And so what I did is I, with this I sat down and I thought, well, what? What is the story here? And then I thought back to that, that story I just told you, the going and the burning of the cabins, because I thought that was so dramatic. You know, these guys all, they, they were all single, they were all bachelors, there weren't hardly any women around, and most women wouldn't want to marry these guys anyway because they were 
they were drunks and they were bad behavior. <laughs> you know, they, were, they were just bad news, a lot of them. And um, so they made this conscious decision, if it's true or not, because we don't you know, it's an apocryphal story. Um, so they got on the horse and they rode to their friend's cabin and they burned that one. And they killed the animals too, that didn't put that in there, because you know, there's nobody else who's going to take care of the animals. So the favorite dog was shot, you know, the uh, cattle that are in the yard was shot. And, and then they go off to war, and I thought, well, this is just such an amazing story. So where did we start? We started with it. And I made the point that it may be apocryphal, because I've never been able to confirm this story, um, whether it happened or not. We do know that those remittance men did leave, but did they burn their cabins and that? Who knows? It's, it's a good story anyway. So <laughs> you just make the point that you know it may or may not have happened. And then but you have to find you did you you stumbled across the story, but one of the things I think some people they come at it with the idea of what the story already is. Mm -hmm. Hey, I think the story is going to be this, so I'm going to be I'm going to look for stuff to support my story versus people that find as much information as they can and then try to figure out what the story is. Now there are two very different ways of doing it. Yeah, and I, I come at it from very much the I'll go and get the research and I'll find the story. So for example, with Forgotten Victory, which is about the Rhineland campaign, I didn't look at that and say, well, I'm going to write the story about how Canadians um, persevered in the, in the Rhineland campaign. Because I didn't really, you know, that, what was the real story there? And as I did the research more and more and more and dug around in it, I started to find that well, it was interesting because the first, not only did the Canadians win against the Germans on the west bank of the Rhine River, they effectively destroyed the last elite divisions that the Germans had on the Western Front. And so arguably, in a way, they kind of won the war at that particular time. Because, and you look at it, the war is over in five, five more weeks. Um, it's over because the Germans have nothing left on the other side of the Rhine River to really effectively oppose the Allies crossing the river. And so you find the theme. I never go in with this is the theme and now I'm going to prove it. Because I think then what you do is you people then end up twisting the facts and trying to fit them in. <laughs> you can't, you can't cut yourself. Yeah. You, you, you really, you're, you're so focused on on your idea of the story, you might miss the important things that happen. Yeah, exactly. And and you see that where we right over we walk right by, you know, some really important historical element because they're so fixated on what they want to prove. Now if you can indulge me, um, I started as a journalist, I'm not a professional historian, I'm a reporter um, for many years and I, I went to a, a, my first journalism school and uh, something you said brought back a memory for me. I was sent out as a class assignment uh, to do a story, and I was, gosh, the first thing I was panicking. Like, my God, I'll never, how do you find a story idea? What is a story idea? I don't know what that is. And then I heard, I went to get my hair cut. I'm a bit of a cheapskate, so I wanted to find some place that was economical, couldn't, couldn't pay 60 bucks for a haircut. And I found the, uh, what turned out to be the oldest barber in PEI. <laughs> He'd been cutting hair for 60 years, and he was about to retire. He still did everything with a straight razor. And I, he put me in the old chair, and I remember him kind of leading me back. Two things struck me. When he traced the outline of my hairline with the edge of the straight razor, and I could actually hear every blade snap as it went by. <laughs> and the other thing was the smell. It just brought me back to memories of my grandfather. Just that, that, that uh, ointment that he would put in, in the combs and stuff. And so when I wrote my article, for, excuse me, for the school paper, I said, I, I, I talked about the feeling that blade, but also, the smell of the tonic, which reminded me of my grandfather's fedora. And uh, my instructor said, why don't you try to sell it? So I sold it to the Charlottetown Berry, the first story I ever sold. And I said, I said, why, why this story? And he said, you had me with the smell. And he said, details matter. Yeah, and details sensory matter. matter. Sensory, sensory matter. matter. Sensory Did you matter. always know that, or is that something you had to learn or were taught? I, you know, I, I was, I didn't turn out something like you. And I don't remember us being taught that sensory thing. That was something I did. I started to learn as I worked along. And I learned some of that from other writers, and Pierre Burton, one of them, because I noticed how Burton did that so much. 
Um, he was always looking at the factor that we have five senses and trying to bring in all those five senses. And it's hard to do in history, <laughs> you know, because you, you, know, you need somebody to describe what did it smell like. Particular smell, taste, and to some extent feel are the ones that are hardest to get into. But yeah, I, I learned it. And then, as I, you know, I did mention, I am also a novelist, and you really get to learn that kind of writing technique, and you start trying to do it all. See, I've always been jealous of novelists because I, whenever you go out, you'd be looking for that amazing quote or that amazing story, and you're like, oh, well, you could just make it up. Yeah. Uh, so, so as, as somebody who you yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you switch hats? How do you go from one to the other? And, and, and how do you not morph into that literary nonfiction where people are kind of imagining scenes as they may have unfolded? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I, I, I've, it's kind of, I think maybe because I used the free fall method. And, and uh, so when I'm writing a novel, I don't have to have all these, it used to be all, all the historical research material was, was paper. Now it's digital images on a computer screen because you need to photograph from the archives. Um, so I'm looking at it, you know, when I'm a novelist, I'm not having to look at the screen. I'm not having to be flipping through paper every time I want to come up with another sentence. I can just let my senses um, and my sense of the story flow. And it's much faster, right? You know, novels are, they're a lucky bunch. You know, you can sit down with 5,000 words in a day. <laughs> if you're on a roll, um, you don't do that often when you're doing history writing. But there's a difference. No, I was actually thinking um, there's lots of schools that teach writing in there. You know, journalism schools, there's writing schools, creative writing classes. I think one of the best storytellers I've ever met is my dad, mm -hmm. um, Peter Reed, uh, a farmer. And uh, I used to laugh because whenever our friends as teenagers would come over, um, they'd all dread it, not because they didn't like my dad, but because dad would never stop talking. <laughs> and then even I remember one fellow was, was backing out of the uh, driveway, I grew up in a little village in Nova Scotia, and, and my dad had his elbow on the window and wouldn't get it off, and he was walking as the car was back, <laughs> telling his stories, and I'm just like, oh gosh, dad, what are you doing? And then now I realize I've actually got sort of some of those bad habits myself. You know? um, but my, my dad was like that too. Yeah, it's a natural story to me. Yeah. And so this is one of the things I wonder, because you, you want to talk to young people, young people come into our office, they do internships. I speak at a local journalism school sometimes. You see a bunch of hopeful faces in the crowd, and you think, everybody here can learn how to put a sentence together, everybody knows how to structure a paragraph. Does everybody here know what a story is? Is that something that can be taught, or is that something that's born? I think it's it's. I think it's both. I think I think you know we. You run into people who are just natural born storytellers, and, and um, they've got that ability. And uh, you know, my dad, your dad, we're, we're both uh, part of that. And but I do think you can learn that storytelling technique, and that uh, then you. you Get the techniques, like some of the things I mentioned, you know, how to do, you know, actually describe scenes and that, and dialogue and character. And really it comes down to doing it over and over and over again. Um, my, my wife teaches at uh, the University of Victoria's creative nonfiction department, um, a, a course in, in writing nonfiction, and it's a workshop course. And, you can see the exhaustion of your students when they've had to rewrite this particular piece of material three or four times. But each time, and they often don't see it, each time you can see they're getting a little bit closer to really becoming a writer. And it's wonderful when you see that moment when somebody's writing goes from serviceable to really being a, something that can be put into print. And it's it's not something that's gonna happen overnight. And one of the things that so many, uh, I find with so many young writers these days is a lack of patience. They expect things to happen, because the world is happening so fast. And so they expect, you know, they're, they're gonna be a star now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they, the, the realization that no, you're actually gonna have to work really hard and spend a long time studying the craft 
And when you learn the craft, then you'll be able to apply that, that sense of story to it and, and use the craft to be a storyteller and a really good storyteller. It's funny, um, just sort of thinking, uh, on, on occasion when we've had interns or students in, um, and I hope I didn't sound too brusque, I'm sure I was busy trying to uh, do a book or do something or a magazine, mm -hmm. and uh, someone would walk in my office and say, no, I just don't understand, it's just not coming. And I said, well, to try moving your hands up and down, you never know what's going to come out. Yeah. You know, it's like, just keep moving your hands. Mm -hmm. You'll probably end up deleting three quarters of yeah. And I always say, too, it's not the writing, it's the rewriting. Yeah. It's the rewriting. You look at a sentence, it comes out, and I, you should, I do my editors know every issue, uh, and uh, my second-in-command, Nell Oster, who's a very talented editor, uh, I always it's our big laugh now. I walk over and I said, all right, Nell, hit me with the red ink, and I just put it on her desk, and it just comes back. But, but it's, it's also, and that's actually a good point, um, you know, you need a good editor. Yes. Uh, I've been blessed to have, um, with Kay and Battle Series, two good editors. Uh, the first one we did about the first six books, and then she realized that she needed a pension and went off to work for government. Uh, <laughs> now I've got a new one who isn't that smart yet. <laughs> And she's been bit excellent as well. Um, and it's, it's really true. You know, um, you see that with self-published books all the time and all that uh, are coming out. And you know, you can tell which ones have had an editor and which ones haven't. Um, cause you, you, the ones that had an editor have tear stains on the manuscript. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, there's pain in some group there. And um, it's just a, it's very important. And, and the really, you know, I use the free fall writing method, which really is just sitting down and pouring words on the page. You know, nowadays I call it controlled free fall, so it's sort of like a parachute, a guy jumping out of a plane with a parachute. <laughs> you know, I can kind of control it. And, and so I'm not writing, you know, when, when I was first starting out, I I would often, if I was writing a magazine article for a book year magazine, um, it was 3,000 words, say, I did this side. I would easily write 10,000 words and then have to kind of, you know, throw out 7,000 of them. That's the hardest thing for young people. Every word's going to be valuable, right? <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah, we say every word's gold except for the platinum ones, right? Yeah. And the funny thing is, is what you often end up doing is killing all the favorites. Often the thing you thought was the best piece of writing is the worst piece of writing. And that's the one that ends up getting chucked because it has no place in the rest of the piece. And if you want, you can put those away and, and hope that they are usable someday. Um, I used to do that more when I was actually typing out articles. <laughs> Nowadays it's so easy on the computer just to be writing over yourself. Um, but you, it really is write and write more. Always write more than what you need. Um, because of the, in the process of that cutting back, cutting back, cutting back, it gets sharper and sharper and sharper. And then you've got something really that's going to be a dynamic piece of writing. Now, I just want to take a step back and talk specifically about your chosen uh, focus, really, in terms of military history. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we lost the first or the last Canadian veteran of World War I in 2010. Mm -hmm. no, there's none left. Um, a lot of the World War II veterans are in their 80s now and 90s. Um, soon, we won't have uh, the benefit of their wisdom anymore. Um, and yet you have made your life's passion giving voice to these men and women, uh, this generation. I just wonder in terms of thinking down the road, um, nobody keeps memoirs anymore. No one writes passionate love letters to their sweethearts, you know, page after page, uh, mud splattered in a trench. A uh, quick email, how's it going, honey? Say hi to the kids. I'll, I'll snap a pic and I'll tweet it to you. Um, how do you think that's going to affect the I've been thinking about that a lot because of Afghanistan. And, you know, the military experience in Afghanistan was quite different than the military experience of World War II. And it was, really. You know, even when these guys were over, over there, you know, they were still kind of wired in. You know, they were sending back emails and things like that. And that's how people communicate. email and through the computer and, and things. And there is this question, are we losing what that generation in World War II had, which was a, a culture of letter writing 
that's how you communicate it. You know, you look at the torturous amount of time that went where um, a soldier would write his letter and he gives it in and it's, it goes through the censorship process. And then it starts this long, slow journey back to Canada and eventually it arrives at his wife's door. It can be three weeks or a month that's passed. And then she sits down and writes to him. Well, the, the, trans, the changes are amazing that, that have already happened in both those people's lives at the time that these letters are intersecting. Where now it's microseconds. Well, you hear those stories of someone saying, hey, honey, uh, give the kids a kiss. I dream of you every night. And by the time it lands, um, it's, uh, it, it already had been preceded by the telegram saying that mm -hmm. he'd been killed by shrapnel. Yeah. Um, and you get the double whammy, mean, you get the double yeah. emotional blow. Yeah. And that happened quite a lot. That was, that was, uh, so, you know, and uh, as well, what one hopes is that then that material ends up at the Canadian War Museum, at the Library of Archives Canada, somewhere where I and other people can find it. <laughs> you know? um, because we rely on that kind of thing. Now, what is going to be the depository for all the emails that the guys sent from Afghanistan and that their wives and friends and stuff sent to them. I don't or do know. they even see it? Or they significant? They probably don't. Who looks at their emails in the middle of a battlefield today and says, gosh, I better save a copy of that in case they wanted a library archives. Yeah, I know. So we're, we're, we're growing, we're we living now in a, in a, in a sense in a deletable history. Yeah. Um, Video game wars in a deletable mm -hmm. history. Yeah. Because there is a, a, a concern that um, only uh, for, the, for the longest time, there was only one type of story, one type of narrative, you know, and then now we talk about multiple stories in Canada, multiple different backgrounds, multiple stories. Yeah, I think uh, every story, there's certain key elements that are in every story, and that really is the, if you could do it, is what you want to, you want the reader to see the story evolving in their mind almost as a film. So the film has sound, the film has uh, the, what you see. Um, film doesn't have smell and touch and that. They did say that smell of vision. <laughs> smell of vision, <laughs> yes. Um, so that's the advantage we as writers of, of text have, is we can delve, delve into those uh, other senses. But really, what you are trying to do is that uh, what I had is the sense of a camera off your shoulder and where it's looking through the eyes of a particular person. You pick, you can pick whoever you want as that person um, and, to, and tell their story. And I think that's the thing is with Canadian history is we have this vast canvas of, of experiences of multiculturalism, of, of uh, new Canadians, old Canadians, <laughs> First Nations, um, all those stories need to be told and and um, and be brought to life. And you know, the question is, is oh, how do you know? Are, do we have a large enough publishing world to actually publish all that material, those stories? And one hopes that that's the case, that that will grow. When I first set out to try and sell Ratona as an idea, which was my first Canadian Valley. I, this was in the late 1980s, and I approached many publishers. And I had got the idea because I'd gone to a region and heard some Canadians, some veterans talking about the horrors of their experience in Ortona. And I thought, well, there should be a book about this. And so I went and looked. And there wasn't one. There was no book on the battle at all that I could find. So I decided someone should write the book. And so then I sort of thought I was working as a freelance magazine or a article writer at the time. And I thought, well, okay, I guess I'll try. So I did a book proposal and I learned, you know, that's the thing, you gotta learn how to do a book proposal and you, you send that off to publishers, and I did. And I got a lot of nice rejections. Um, <laughs> and, were nice. and one was particularly interesting. It was from the editor at Stoddard Mag Publishing. And he wrote, um, this is a very interesting subject and I, I love military history, he said, but it was all a long time ago, and all the veterans are dying off, and nobody really cares anymore. And uh, I thought, okay, that, that pretty much broke my day. <laughs> and then, you know what happened? Is the movie Private, Saving Private Ryan came out. 
And within a month, that same editor is on the phone and we're doing a book contract for a tome. Um, so there was a sea change. And it all comes down to, in Cedric Pride and Brian, the moments in the cemetery. The scene in this, this day is really, that, that's the thing, is because that's a, that is a scene about remembrance. And people watch that and most of them cried. <laughs> and I remember going to the Cenotaph in Victoria um, the year before that. There was maybe 500 people in the crowd. The year after Crusader Private Ryan had come up, it had only been out a month and a half, there were 1,500 people. And it's never changed. So there is a third, uh, an appetite amongst the publishing industry for history, but the industry is contracted. And we're seeing publishers going out of business and or disappearing or going in entirely uh, ebook directions. That's sort of changing. It's not as hot as everyone thought it was going to be. <laughs> Surprise. And so, the, you know, it is changing. And so I, what I would say is, and it's, I think it's been true all the time, you have, you have to show that you can write like Pierre Burton or better. And if you do that, you'll be able to find a publisher. But if you come along with something that's dry and boring and dusty, no matter what the subject, it can be the most amazingly vital, important, historical subject that ever needed to be written about. But if you come at it in a dull way, you're not going to get past an editor, and you're never going to get a book contract. So you've got to do. So you've got to be a good historian, and you've got to be a good writer. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, it's been a really good discussion, and uh, Mark, thanks so much for for joining us. Thank you.